Thank you, friends, for singing my favorite song. Uh, that is the song I want sung at my funeral. Let's pray. God, we long for that day when we will be finally home, which is an acknowledgement that this is not our home. This is where you have us by your perfect plan and your good purposes. This is where we have opportunities, where we have moments, where we have relationships, where we have responsibilities. And yet this is not where we belong. This is not where our citizenship is. This is not where our ultimate things are, our treasures, our hope, our infinite joy. All of that remains to be seen. We long for that day when faith becomes sight, when prayer becomes praise, when we get to be in your very presence. This morning, O oh God, as we come together to hear from you, we long to do just that, to give our ear to your word. I pray that you would prepare us even now. Uh, let these words fall on soft hearts, on eager minds, on lives ready to apply what you have for us eager to hear from you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 this morning as we continue our study of that wonderful book. I don't know if you've ever tried this experiment, but at 50 degrees below zero, a cup full of coffee tossed into the air turns into a crystalline cloud, and spit will crackle before it hits the ground as it freezes. As a kid, I was enthralled by a short story written in 1908 by Jack London entitled, To Build a Fire. It's a story of a remarkable man, resourceful man, uh, living in Yukon Territory, uh, working on uh, mining, trying to make his way he had grown accustomed to living in cold environments. He had a faithful dog, a husky. And he set out one day for a mining camp miles away. He had heard that the weather was going to get a little bit cold, by a little bit cold, like 75 degrees below zero. And he decided to set out anyway. He knew that he had what it takes to survive a little trek through the barren, frozen wasteland. As he crossed rivers, he thought, I need to be careful. I need to spot out where the ice is thin, where it's thick enough for me to traverse. He knew how to get from point A to point B. He stopped for lunch, built himself a fire, and had a nice warm meal as he continued on his way. After lunch, however, he fell through some thin ice and got his feet and legs soaking wet. He thought, ah, no big deal. If I want to keep myself from dying of hypothermia, all I need to do is build a fire, dry out my socks and my boots, and then carry on with my track. He built his fire. With all of his resourcefulness and skill and just a few matches, he gathered kindling and larger wood, and he built a roaring fire and had his socks drying out quite nicely until the heat from his fire melted the snow on the pine branches above his head and the snow fell off the branches and put out his fire. And for the first time, the man was frightened. He knew that he needed to set another fire in order to dry out his clothes and warm up his toes if he had a chance of survival. It was the first time that he thought he might not make it. He tried in vain to start another fire and was unsuccessful. And decided, well, I just need to warm up by hiking. And it wasn't very long before he succumbed to the cold, buried himself in the snow, and gave up. His dog survived and went on to the destination just fine. This man had resources, skill, wisdom, insight. But he was overtaken in a moment of crisis and met his tragic end. What we're going to look at this morning in Ecclesiastes is the relationships between wisdom, success, sin, and the sovereignty of God. The title of this morning's message is Sages, Sinners, Success, and the Sovereignty of God. This is a, a section of scripture, both the end of chapter 9 and what we'll look at next week in chapter 10, 
that tells us a little bit about the relationship between wisdom and its application, skills and their use, and what we should expect as the results. Now, scholars looking at this section of Scripture have believed that Solomon was sort of scatterbrained here, that the verses we're going to look at this morning and next week are not really tied by any uh, uniform thought, any unifying theme, but they are rather random, scattered, unconnected thoughts. And it's almost as if Solomon can't decide whether he likes wisdom or doesn't like wisdom. He's going to say some things that are a positive view of wisdom and skill and hard work. And he's going to say other things that seem to indicate that all of those are futile efforts. Well, which is it, Solomon? Is wisdom good? Is it bad? What should we do? But I think there is a unifying theme here in the text of Scripture we'll look at this morning. And that theme is that wisdom is good. Wisdom is good. But it's not a guarantee. Wisdom is good, but wisdom is not God. Wisdom is valuable, but wisdom is also vulnerable. That is, the the right use of the best information, the skillful use of even God's wisdom, cannot guarantee outcomes the way we might like to think. Let's read together Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Verses 11 to 18. Solomon writes, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the warriors, and neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability. For time and chance overtake them all. Moreover, man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. There was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works around it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. This section of scripture certainly upholds the value of wisdom, while at the same time denying the invulnerability of wisdom. If this passage does something for us, I think it is a cautionary tale about an assessment of our own abilities to apply wisdom or our own trust in wisdom itself, in strategies, in planning, in responsibilities. We would be arrogant to think that we can, by our skillful living, trump God's sovereignty or trump human depravity. And what is this passage all about? That wisdom tends towards success, but it is often overruled by God and overturned by sinners. Wisdom tends toward success. A friend of mine asked me this week, Uh, Didn't Solomon, the author of Ecclesiastes, also write most of the book of Proverbs? Yes. Why are we finding in Ecclesiastes something that at times seems opposed to the book of Proverbs? And this is a great question. This is an insightful question, and I think we need to dig into the relationships between the various strands of wisdom literature in our Bibles. The book of Proverbs gives us a lot of instructions about wise living, what wisdom is, and and how it should be played out. The book of Job tells us what happens when a wise man living rightly has circumstances that defy understanding. Psalm 37 and Psalm 73 and a lot of the other wisdom psalms also detail for us what life is like when the wise and the just don't seem to get circumstances according to the ways that they've lived. Much of Ecclesiastes is aimed at telling us, again, wisdom is good, but we lived in a cursed 
world, a broken world, a fallen world. And there are forces at work besides cause and effect, right, wise living producing the kinds of prosperity and comfortable living that we might hope for. Wisdom is good, but not a guarantee. Again, wisdom is good, but wisdom is not God. And if our, play, if our trust is misplaced, that is placed on our own ability to live wisely, skillfully, rather than our trust being in God himself, we will flail when circumstances go awry. Let's think about a couple of the principles from Proverbs. You can look at Proverbs chapter 26. You've probably seen this before. In Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, you have two Proverbs back to back, two wisdom nuggets from God that we're to live by. And Proverbs 26, 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or else you will be like him. And Proverbs 26, 5 says, Answer a fool as his folly deserves, that he not be wise in his own eyes. Have you ever read those back to back and thought, well, which one is it? (laughs) Do I answer a fool according to his folly or do I not answer a fool according to his folly? If I answer a fool according to his folly, maybe there's hope that I can help him see he's not as smart as he thinks he is. But if I answer a fool according to his folly, I might end up being just like him. So which is it, Solomon? What am I to do? And the short answer to this, I'll steal from Joel James, it takes wisdom to use wisdom. The employment of wisdom itself requires wisdom. In other words, these are not statements given as promises or commands as universal statements. These are proverbial statements of wisdom. Think about Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, doesn't it? Always? No, not always. But generally speaking, it's hard for somebody to fight with you when you lay down in front of them gently, kindly. You return good for evil. It certainly is much better than returning evil for evil and amplifying a quarrelsome situation. But when it doesn't turn out that way, when a gentle answer doesn't turn away wrath, when Leading into World War II, European nations attempted gentle answers and it didn't turn away wrath. We know that this isn't a a universal promise, but rather a proverbial principle. Another famous one is Proverbs 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And I think many of us as parents have clung to that verse as a promise maybe misunderstanding the nature of what Proverbs is and and what proverbial literature, how it is to be held on to as some sort of guarantee that kids who grow up in Christian homes will be Christians. Well, that takes away from the depravity of man and the sovereignty of God, (laughs) the whole point of this passage. Wisdom is good. Listen, if you decided not to train your children, (laughs) what is the probable outcome, the probable result? A disaster. The point here is not to throw away wisdom because it doesn't always work, but hold on to wisdom, value wisdom, but recognize its limitations. You've heard the phrase, a stitch in time saves nine. What does that mean? Uh, Well, if you have a little tear in your favorite sweater, snag or something, and you repair it with one stitch... Uh, you do so before it becomes a, a larger tear and it requires nine stitches, right? It's a, it's a truism. One stitch now keeps you from a larger repair later. But then when your little brother borrows that favorite sweater to practice his street running skills and demolishes your sweater while trying to clear a chain link fence, you realize that that single stitch did not guarantee the lasting quality of your sweater. Things happen. There's a danger for us if we could think that we could enlist some of God's principles for wise living. We could practice them diligently, prayerlessly, and think that we get a guaranteed outcome. What we're going to see here in Ecclesiastes 9 and 10 is that 
independent adherence to skill, design, strategy, and wisdom is not going to help us get through life. We may be surprised to find that God is sovereign and people are sinners and they ruin the best laid plans. The task ahead of us rather is to be humble, dependent, employing wisdom not as the end all, but as one of God's means for helping us through life in a God-cursed, sin-infected, broken world. God's wisdom is not a tool to get what I want. Rather, God's wisdom should be employed in the hands of a, a worshiper whose heart is bent on pleasing him. That's the message of this section. And we'll look first that wisdom tends towards success, but in verses 11 and 12, we discover wisdom can be overruled by the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 11. I again saw under the sun. Here Solomon is making more observations on life under the sun, and he's lowered his gaze to our earthly existence. What does he see? That the race is not to the swift, the battle is not to the warriors, bread is not to the wise, or wealth to the discerning, nor favor to the men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. What does Solomon see here? That things don't work out the way they should. He gives five categories, and we would agree that, generally speaking, the faster runner wins the race. Generally, the better army wins the battle. Generally, the wise worker brings home the bacon. Generally, the smart investor makes the money. And generally, the talented person gains the notoriety. That is what should happen. What Solomon is observing in verse 11 is that it doesn't. You could look out under the sun and take every one of these categories and, and see example after example of when that just didn't work out. And all of life is a little like those votes that we cast in high school. You know, everybody sort of took a poll. Who is the most likely to succeed? The most likely to travel the world? The most likely in our class to become president? The most likely to live in a van down by the river? You remember those? I don't know what you were voted for. I'd be curious to know how many of those turned out. The life is unpredictable. The life is not programmable. Ranked football teams lose to unranked opponents. The tortoise beat the hare. David defeated Goliath. And generally speaking, the faster runner does win the race. And Solomon says here, but the race is not to the swift. And what do we do with that? If you set out to run races, you should probably practice and train, and it would be better if you were faster than all the other racers. The likelihood that you would win a race if you're the slowest is not very high. And yet your being the fastest in a heat does not guarantee the outcome. You can trip. Your partner that's supposed to pass you the baton can drop the baton. You can hit a hurdle. A meteor could strike you as you're running the race from somewhere in outer space. Generally, the better army wins the battle. But Solomon says the battle is not to the warriors. Now, if you're going to set out to start a war, you would be wise to have a better army to be better prepared, better trained, have more people and better weapons. But the better army doesn't always win. Generally, the wise worker brings home the bacon. But Solomon says the, the bread is not to the wise. And Proverbs 12, 11 gives us the principle, he who tills his land will have plenty of bread, as opposed to the one who pursues worthless things who lacks sense. If you want to eat, you have to work for it. If you don't work for it, you're going to lack food. But working as hard as you can, doing all the things that you should do, planting when you're supposed to plant, weeding when you're supposed to weed, watering when you're supposed to water, harvesting when you're supposed to harvest, does not guarantee that you get to eat at the end of the day. Generally, the smart investor makes the money. 
Listen to Proverbs 10.4. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. You do those things which bring about an income, and the likelihood that you will have that income is there. But Solomon says, but wealth is not to the discerning. In other words, it doesn't always work out that way. Generally, the talented person gains the notoriety. Do you see a man skilled in his work, Solomon says in Proverbs twenty-two twenty-nine? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. In other words, the, the, the one with ability, the one with skill, the, the best at what they do, the artisan, the craftsman, they will stand before nobility because of their work. It will be seen for what it is. And here in Ecclesiastes 9, favor is not to men of ability. This is an enigma. You can think of those people who became famous after they died. Emily Dickinson, uh, some 1,800 poems were uh, discovered that she had written, many of them published. Only seven of her poems were published during her lifetime, and all of them were edited because they didn't fit the norms of poetry in her day. Edgar Allan Poe sold his poem, The Raven, for $8. It was after his death that his individual works are credited with spurring entire genres and literary movements. Vincent van Gogh, who was really unknown until after his death, uh, one of his paintings today could fetch $100 million. It doesn't always work out that you get recognized for the things that you do in this lifetime. What is the answer? Quit trying. No. Just recognize that for all of your efforts, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. You might study hard for a test and show up in class to discover the teacher has made it an open book test. Or you might show up for the exam and for all of your studying, the teacher asked the one question that you didn't look over. Or what's the answer? Well, forget studying. No, don't do that. You'll be shown to be the fool on the next exam. You might develop the perfect diet to, to lose weight or to gain weight, whatever it is you're trying to do, and, and then get an injury or have some sort of disease that thwarts every effort. A friend of mine is an extreme athlete with the most unbelievable dedication to his sport. Hundreds of pull-ups a day, lifting weights and a rigorous diet, all designed to maximize muscle, and he couldn't put on weight, and he couldn't gain muscle mass. He discovered that he had a rare tissue disorder requiring radical heart surgery. And it keeps him from the sport that he trained his whole life for. You might develop the perfect financial plan. Set up the perfect nest egg for retirement. But your employer lets you go the day before your retirement package would have been guaranteed. A friend of mine in his late 50s had that happen this week. No job and the pension he worked so hard for has evaporated. You would be a fool not to have some strategy and some plan for retirement. But all of those strategies, all of that planning is subject to the sovereignty of God. You can spend years remodeling a home but lose it to fire or flood or have it just taken by the big hand of government. You can avoid every household product that bears the label, this product contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer in laboratory animals. And you can still get cancer. Notice the end of verse 11. For time and chance overtake them all. And again, the word chance here uh, is really the word for event or occurrence or happening. This isn't some blind fate, some sort of pagan idea. Uh, this is God's doing. It, by speaking of chance or speaking of an occurrence, it really is an event which is unknown to you. It doesn't mean that it's unknown altogether. God knows what he's doing. It's a surprise to us. And it overtakes us all. There's a second aspect to God's overruling man's best efforts. And that is the unpredictability of the troublesome events that come. Ending in death. Look at verse 12. Moreover, man does not know his time. 
And his time there could be a reference to some adverse calamity or it could be a reference to the end of his days. Time's up. Death. And he says, like fish caught in a treacherous net or birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Like fish in a net. Like birds in a trap. It's unanticipated, unexpected. If I were a fish and I knew that a net was in my path, I would have swum the other way. We all know that death is the final unexpected outcome of life. What Solomon says in verse 12 when he says, so the sons of men, he literally says, so the sons of the man. We've heard this refrain over and over again. The sons of Ha-Adam, the sons of the Adam a reminder of our descent from those first parents who plunged the entire human race into sin. We are reaping the consequences and the repayment for sin, generally speaking, and that is death. We ought to expect death, for it is the one inevitable reality of life, but it seems to always catch us by surprise. Your skill, your talents, your hard work, they can help you in life, but they cannot ensure success and they cannot prevent your departure from this world. All of this is designed by God and written by Solomon to promote a simple dependence on God as though we really had nothing and we needed Him for everything. And listen, this is hard for us. If we have skills or gifts or abilities or talents it's really difficult for us to employ them with diligence and with wisdom and yet not to trust in them, not to rest in them, not to live as if all of everything that we do really depended on our abilities. Listen to the charge of God against his people. Habakkuk 1.16, Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and they burn incense to their fishing net because through these things their catch is large and their food is plentiful. And there the, God is speaking through the prophet about Israel's enemies and what it is that they worship. They worship their nets thinking that Oh yeah, they, they make provision for themselves. They, they, they go to work every day and they drag home fish in their nets and then they eat what they themselves have caught and they bow down and worship the nets that they made, the tools, the implements of their work. And It's all about them. My food is from me and through me and to me. To me be the glory forever. Amen. Right? And that worship of self is carried out in the, the worship of this tool that I made to go get my dinner. What an idolatrous thought that is. The the ignorance of God and his gracious provision of food for me to eat, right? The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 33. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. Now, if a king wants to wage war, should he have an army? Yeah. Should he have horses? Probably not in the 21st century. Um, Cavalry went out of vogue a while ago. A king should plan. But the source of victory, ultimately, is not in armies and weaponry and implements. Victory belongs to the Lord. Proverbs 21, 30 to 31, There is no wisdom and there is no understanding and there is no counsel against the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but victory belongs to the Lord. You see, both of those are there. A horse can be prepared for battle, but victory rests with him. Jeremiah 10, 23 says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Everything we do, every aspect of life is governed by the sovereign hand of God. And when things don't go the way that we want, we ought to be reminded, oh, that's right, I'm I'm not the source of everything. My strength is not enough. My wisdom is not enough. My skill set is not enough to ensure prosperity and victory in my life. And when things go well for us, what should we do? God, thank you. You were responsible for this. God is to get the credit. 
In 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan, the son of King Saul, Jonathan and his armor bearer were out spying out one of the Philistine garrisons. And they took down 20 soldiers of that garrison by themselves. What's interesting is Jonathan's theology behind that little excursion. He said to the young man who was carrying his armor, uh, 1 Samuel 14, 6, Come and let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. Right? Jonathan knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. It was in his hands. Wisdom tends towards success. It's its purpose. But it can be overruled by the sovereignty of God. Wisdom tends towards success, but it can also be overturned by the sinfulness of man. And we see that in verses 13 to 18. Wisdom, for all of its benefits, for all of its value, is not invulnerable to human depravity. And Solomon gives a parable in verses 13 to 15. He, he tells a story, and whether Solomon is referring to some historical situation he knew, or whether he was just concocting a story to paint the picture, here it is in verse 13. Also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. There was a small city with few men in it, and a great king came to it, surrounded it, and constructed large siege works against it. But there was found in that city a poor wise man, and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. What is this scene? A, a greatly outmatched city, perhaps with few defenses, but a poor man with wisdom lives in that city. You and I might be okay with the category of a poor wise man. That would be shocking to an Israelite perspective. Wisdom was supposed to produce prosperity. If you saw somebody who was not physically, financially prosperous, they must be under the curse of God. They must have done something wrong. They must be a fool. That was the common thinking. And here Solomon portrays a wise man who isn't prospering. Right? His, his wisdom, his discernment, his skill at living has not floated his financial boat. And yet he saves a city. I don't think this passage is prophetic, but it sort of pre-minds us of a historical event, uh, the Battle of Syracuse in 214 to 212 B.C. Uh, the Roman Empire had had agreements with several independent city-states, and Syracuse was one of those, a city that sat on rocks on the side of the ocean. In the Battle of Syracuse, Rome decided, well, we want to envelop this city into our empire. We don't want them to live on their own. We want to be able to have them for ourselves. And so the Roman army and navy besieged that independent city kingdom. And in the city of Syracuse was a man named Archimedes. You may remember him from your geometry textbooks. He invented a number of wonderful principles, and uh, we are still using tools today that Archimedes invented. Uh, but three remarkable inventions uh, helped the city of Syracuse against the siege of the Romans. Uh, he invented the claw, the heat ray, and a series of contraptions to fire darts and other missiles at the enemy from the walls of the city. Now, the claw was this giant crane contraption that would reach down over the walls and clomp itself onto big Roman ships, pick them up out of the water, and drop them back down into the water, smashing them to smithereens. The heat ray was a series of parabolic mirrors he set up to direct the heat of the sun at the sails of the ships and set them on fire. Now, he was not a large man. He was not a warrior. He was not skilled at personal hand-to-hand -hand combat and fighting, but his wisdom, his math, saved the city. Well, what's the lesson in all of that? Pay attention in geometry class, kids. It might rescue your city one day. Well, the point is that wisdom is beneficial, even against the mighty siege works that had come against the city and all the weapons and implements of the Roman Empire and uh, an army that uh, would have outclassed that city. And it was saved by wisdom. Wisdom delivers a whole city in verse 15. In verse 16, wisdom is better than strength. 
It's great. Solomon's saying wisdom's good, but <laughs> wisdom is vulnerable. Look at verse 15. No one remembered that poor man. Wisdom wasn't rewarded. In fact, at the, at the second siege in the Battle of Syracuse, uh, the, the Roman army finally did take over and they said, well, uh, let Archimedes live. You know, why would the Roman Empire want Archimedes to live? We want the claw. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. And uh, a common Roman soldier killed him. Either didn't know who he was or just disobeyed orders. Sad ending to such a great mind. Wisdom can be forgotten in verse 15. Wisdom can be uh, despised and unheeded in verse 16. Here Solomon says, wisdom is better than strength, but the wisdom of the poor man is despised and his words are not heeded. Listen, I think there's a general principle here. When, when somebody is on the lower end of the social stratus, he may not get listened to. Right? Are the wisest of the wise in our culture receiving the most followers on Twitter? It doesn't work that way. Wisdom can not only go unlistened to, but actually despised. And really good ideas go left unheeded. In verse 17, wisdom can be drowned out. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Two things going on in verse 17. Uh, Solomon is upholding the value of wisdom and he's saying it gets drowned out by foolishness. The shouting of a ruler in the presence of fools. Um, who's being listened to? The loud mouth. And who's being not listened to? The wise. The loudest voice is not necessarily the best to listen to. The most readily available information is not always the truest Best sellers and the most downloaded and whatever comes to the top of a Google search. <laughs> that may not be your best source of the best things out there. Often wisdom is sought when circumstances are dire. Why would the poor man be listened to in the, the time of crisis? Well, because we need somebody. And after the crisis is abated, wisdom doesn't have a voice anymore. The right ideas are seldom popular for long. The masses choose their fads and their entertainments and wisdom gets left behind. Now, wisdom is good, but wisdom is not a guarantee. Now, wisdom is a good thing from God, but wisdom itself is not God. Wisdom can so easily be overturned by the depravity of man. Now, how many depraved humans does it take to overturn good wisdom? Well, look at verse 18. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. One sinner does much harm. You don't have to look long in the 20th century to discover the perpetrators of much harm. Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler, Idi Amin and Pol Pot. Individuals who have caused uncountable, immeasurable harm to the rest of humanity. There is an important lesson for us here in this section of Ecclesiastes, and it will continue into chapter 10 next week. It's important for us to take stock of our own assessment of our abilities, strategies, planning and responsibility. What is it in your own life that you are tempted to trust in? You've got this wired. You've got this figured out. You know how to add one plus one and get it to equal two every single time. And there's a temptation to walk into our days godlessly, independent, prayerless, trusting in self rather than, trust, rather than trusting in God, praising our nets by which we catch our fish rather than going to God for help for our daily bread. There's an independence here, a trusting in a skill set, a, a trusting even in my application of God's wisdom that is misplaced 
if it misses God himself. I heard this week from someone else that the, the difference between my expectations and reality, that space right there, is my level of disappointment. If you want a mathematical equation for your disappointment, subtract the reality from the expectations. Right? And you can do one of two things with that. You can lower your expectations or you can bring your reality up to decrease the level of frustration and disappointment. And the point here for us in Ecclesiastes is we live in a frustrated world and a frustrating world. If our expectation is up here, or we think that wisdom, if applied rightly, skill, if applied rightly, financial planning, if applied rightly, dieting, if applied rightly, avoiding certain things, if applied rightly, will get me to where I want to be, we will be frustrated, disappointed by the sovereignty of God and the sinfulness of man. If, however, I refuse to use wisdom and skill and planning altogether, I will be shown to be the fool and will bring upon myself unneeded, unnecessary disaster and frustration. There's a danger in trusting in our own resources. There is a danger in not doing anything at all. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some boast in chariots, and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. I had that verse inscribed on my uh, flight logbook as a pilot student, a student pilot in college, except I had scratched out chariots and horses and I wrote in airplanes. And, you know, we're not supposed to take away from the Bible. I was just sort of making it relevant to my situation, I suppose. But it was a reminder to me in every procedure with all the planning, all the practice, all the studying, I was never to think that my procedures, my planning, my practice, my study could keep me safe. In fact, all of us uh, guys that were learning to fly together made it a part of our procedure as we were doing a pre-flight inspection and, and checking all of the instrumentation and doing an engine run-up and doing all the things we're supposed to do. Part of the procedure, part of the plan was prayer. Just an acknowledgement that God is sovereign, that things happen, that we live in a broken world, that we will all die, and we're all in his hands. And that didn't make anybody want to not plan, not go through their procedures, not follow everything by the book and the checklist. No, we did all of those things. But we didn't boast in those things. You may have heard the adage, there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old pilots bold pilots, right? That could be said about car drivers. That could be said about uh, any of the circumstances in life. If we're tempted to trust in our own abilities and the things that we do, that is an arrogant way to live. God warned his people about that in Isaiah 31.1. He said, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and they rely on horses, and they trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. Right? They lived under the banner of safety first. Where is safety to be found? Egypt. They've got chariots. They've got horses. We'll be safe if we go to them. And God says, no, you won't. And they weren't. We're safe when we seek the Lord. Where is your trust this morning? Is your trust in the application of God's wisdom? Your ability to skillfully live? Or is your trust in God himself? Here's wisdom from Proverbs 3. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. I found sometimes that Ecclesiastes leaves me with more questions. <laughs> I don't know if you felt that way. And Solomon's point is to draw our attention to the enigmas of life and drive us toward a right relationship to the only one who has the answers, to the one who is the answer. I'll quote Larry Norman who said, 
Don't ask me for the answers. I've only found one, that a man leaves his darkness when he follows the sun, S-O-N. We're so thankful that God the Son himself came, the one who is greater than Solomon, and stood in our midst and taught us and lived among us and went to a cross to die in the place of all who would ever believe. To give them something far better than wise principles for living under the sun. But to give his own life as a ransom for those who will outlive the sun in eternity. And we get to enjoy his presence forever. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ways that your words humble us and draw us to greater dependence upon you. We ask that these words today would have that effect for your glory and for our good in Jesus' name.